So check it out, folks. Everything that we do here, every kind of speaker that we bring on, we always want to tie it back to habits, rituals, results, and being able to kind of take that information, no matter what industry or what circumstance, into your world, because we believe that success leaves clues. It doesn't show up at the front door. And today we're going to get into what it looks like from a humanity standpoint on success, how that could translate to business, and most important most importantly, create for f fulfillment in your heart and your desire. I have with me today my man, Harvey Graham. What's up, Harvey? Good to see you again. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well. Awesome, awesome. So I had the good fortune vis-a-vis -vis Chris Crohn's foundation to uh, spend some days with Harvey in the Ukraine and Harvey and his team at Allied Extract, as well as his ecosystem partner, uh, the Mozart Group, which was uh, Andy Milburn, create paths and corridors for the safety of, of myself, Sean, Chris, Matt, and uh, Adam along the way, and uh, as well as the other people that were with us on that trip. Um, and, you know, when I think about the Ukraine, Harvey, you know, everyone was like, hey, I can't believe you're going over there, the whole nine yards. I really felt, honestly, and I tell everybody this, safe the whole time. My my biggest concern was the trains, just because of comfort, right? And And then when they were saying, yeah, you know, sometimes the Russians like to blow up trains, but it was a moving target. But I really, I got to tell you, I really felt like I was I was not in a place that was extraordinary dangerous, even though it was, right? It certainly was. Yes. And um, and I wasn't confused about that because as we left the, uh, as we left Kiev, made our way to Bucha uh, and, and the other town after that, and you could see the destruction, you know, it was obvious that this was something completely different. But even when I was there, the solemn, the solemn atmosphere reminded me a lot of 9-11 because I worked out on Wall Street at the time over the last 90 days after 9-11, like mm. between September and Christmas. It was just a different feel. And that's how I felt when I was in the Ukraine, right? Yeah. I had that same kind of feeling. So anyway, first of all, my wife, my family, my friends all want to thank you for how safe you made all of us feel. And I think that your journey is so incredible. I'd love to share it with everybody. And as we go through the process, can we just kind of start you know, right back from the beginning, where are you originally from and what were your early years like? So uh, I grew up in the United Kingdom. Um, I grew up in a town called Chichester, which if any of your viewers are historians, they can have a look. We have the second copy of the US Constitution there. Um, but that's a separate story for another day. Okay, uh, second copy, love it. Yeah, second one. Yeah, um, it's probably a lot different now, but yeah. It is. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I grew up there, typical kind of childhood. Um, we weren't particularly wealthy, but we, we did okay. Um, went through my school. My school was a bit of a feeder school for the army. So you were kind of told as, as a young guy, um, cause there was a cadet force integrated into the school. So, so what age was this? Like, like 10, 11, 12, 13, about 12, Got it. about 12, you'd wear an army uniform on a Friday. Got it. Um, the rest of the time you wear school uniform. And a lot of us, when we, when we were leaving school, we all planned to join the army. But, um, the year that I graduated, so I was 17, uh, was when nine 11 happened. You were 17 at the time? I was 17 wow. at the time. We, Got it. we were playing hockey and we were like, wow, something big's happened. Yeah. Um, we'd all kind of grown up like, you know, with stories of kind of what had happened in World War II and everything else and how America had come over and helped us. Um, so when 9-11 happened, a bunch of us just went down to the recruiting office and joined the army. Really? Yeah. And, and we hear about that here in the United States, but that's that's amazing. I, I never, I've never heard it like that before. No, there, there like, was a big line. If America was going to war, like it was kind of our time to kind of pay that back. So... Pretty much about a third of my class went and joined the army uh, within a month of that happening. Wow. So so you, first of all, you go to a, a kind of a military school growing yep. up. Now, is that all people in England or is that just how your parents that raised? Was, that was just my school. Got it. Um, okay. So it your was dad underperforming, and, so it was subsidized a little bit by the military. Understood. Understood. So 9-11 happens, folks, and, and the inspiration uh, to protect humans, which as I got to, to know... Um, Harvey later on, I could see it and, and and how we met each other was that that was the connection there. But so now you join the army uh, based on 9-11 from a different country, by the way. Love that. At the end of the day, what happens next in your journey? And I'm sure it must have led over to the Middle East yeah, based yeah. on where the war was. It did. So I went off and did my infantry training. I joined the infantry. I decided to join kind of like the... Uh, I'd say like the hardest part of the army, but definitely kind of like I wanted to be at the front. If so I you were you were army, looking for a challenge, like you weren't. Yeah, yeah got it. I, I wasn't going to do anything else. So I joined the infantry. We all did. Um, 
And then I went and did my infantry training, but I completed, and we'll come back to this later, the end of my infantry training outside of Lviv in Ukraine, really? where the British army did a huge exercise wow. um, in 2003 to welcome Ukraine into the NATO partnership for peace. And how so, long were you in that training in, in outside of Lviv? How long was that time timeframe? Uh, it was about three and a half weeks. Okay. Wow. And it was like Ukraine in 2003 was very former Soviet. Like it was harrowing levels of poverty, but you could tell like a very kind of fierce patriotism. And like I left, I left there and then I, I deployed to Afghanistan, but always in the back of my head was kind of this country that kind of, I'd come to fairly young and kind of it had touched me at kind of a point in my so, life. So there was, a, there was a definitely a spiritual connection, Yeah. right? So you're now 18, 19, 20 years old, as I'm assuming. And for the folks that are listening, just so they know, Ukraine, uh, was separated from Soviet Union or Russia, I think in 1989, 19, I don't know the year exactly. Yeah, it's around the 90s. Right? And then you're there 13 years later when they're still feeling, they still look a lot like Russia, but they're now tapping into the Western yeah. capitalistic ways. Am, am, am I? Yeah, am I, the, the Ukrainian SSR um, definitely struggled with like European integration as did Poland, as did all the kind of former Warsaw Pact countries. Got it. And and when you were there, you saying the poverty was at astronomical levels based on where yeah. it was before their war recently started? It was like, I had to go to Afghanistan to see poverty worse than that. Got it. Understood. Wow. So so now you did your training there. When you're done, are you are you in Afghanistan? Are you somewhere? Yeah, so literally a couple of weeks later, I was in Kabul, um, early 2003. Got it. And at that point, we kind of controlled the Norfolk Kabul, um, but it was it was under a UN mandate, um, something to do with the transitional authority and the new government there. So it was very like limited mandate. There was only 120 of us in a patrols company, and we were responsible for the entire northeast corner of Kabul. And the Taliban was still there. Yeah. Um, and they were waiting on orders. We were waiting on orders. So there was a very kind of uneasy peace. Um, and we go out on patrols um, and then we bump into you know, Taliban fighters sat kind of at the side of the road, chat with them, have tea with them. But we always knew in the back of our heads that like at any moment it could kind of flare up. And and, wow. Now, I'm, I, I I don't remember you sharing that. That's So let me just kind of play with this a little bit. So it's 03. Everyone's told that their guns are supposed to be down, right? Uh, as a result of it, you would actually you know, the enemy or the opposition, I should say, you guys would actually share some tea and have simple conversations. Am I, am I yeah, understanding? Yeah, you're actually, it was super complicated. So the what was that were, like? It, it was odd because we were kind of taught they were the enemy, but we'd also meet with the Northern Alliance who had got rid of the Taliban. Um, and I actually got to meet the Pancho Guards, which is a very famous Northern Alliance unit. Um, and I have this like memory of being 18 years old and one of them just leaning off his tank and just like picking me up with one hand, even though I'm in a set of body armor, like huge guys, but wow. fantastic Tajik warriors led by Ahmed Shah Massoud back in the day, very famous. Um, was he the guy that was assassinated right before 9-11? Absolutely. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. That was, that, that was when uh, everything changed for them at that point. How did they respond after that? that I, that's they, a, not to digress, but yeah, that's- Yeah, no, it, it was just like this complete uneasiness. Nobody knew what direction anything was gonna go. Yes. So, you'd have rogue Northern Alliance units, rogue narcotics wow. militias, Got rogue it. Taliban units. Some would take controls of villages or, or towns. You'd, you'd get sent in to go and do clearance operations to, to push them out. It was very, nobody knew what was happening. So you were just kind of wandering around on patrol, you know, 12 of you, eight of you, just making a lot of judgment calls. And, and whenever a leader gets taken out or assassinated, that vacuum creates whatever it's gonna create, but it, it's supposed to be very chaotic and you must have experienced that all the time. Yeah, it, it was just, you didn't know what was gonna happen tomorrow. You would go from having cups of tea with the Taliban to Northern Alliance units threatening to send armored brigades in to wipe out your barracks to the Taliban seizing um, certain key locations in the city. Like it was very, very quiet. And then somebody would make a move and everything would just explode instantly. So was the Northern Alliance and the Taliban ever united during this time or were they always enemies? There's always factions. Got it. Um, there's factions that will do deals. Got it. So, so folks, we don't know these complicated matters that happen in these unstable situations when it comes to what war looks like. We know that, um, you know, at the end of the day, why is there war? There's a lot of arguments on why it happens. But I think humans, no matter what, at the end of the day, still all want the same thing. It's when the politics get 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 involved and 
uh, certain leaders that want absolute power, which corrupts absolutely, and it's going to create all this chaos and, and confusion. And f- for you as a young as a young dude, uh, you had seen so much even at that point. Now we're in 03. What, what happens after that? I went straight to Iraq. So I missed the invasion of Iraq, which as an 18-year-old kind of hit me a little bit. I was kind of sad about that. You wanted to be there. Um, so I spent the invasion of Iraq on the front gate of our base, actually in Kabul Got and it. they said once they cross the border these free car bombs are going to come down the road and get us so a bunch of us volunteered to go sit on the front of the gate and ready for the car so bombs. you're just ready to fight yeah they didn't come they went and attacked the German base so you never know with these things if it's because they saw you or if they were, were going for an easier target anyway so immediately after that I went to Iraq um that was late zero three late um into 2004 got it which was when the shia uprising was kind of starting to take place yep um sorry the the sunni uprising was starting to take place um in the sunni triangle in the american sector yep. and we were in basra and alamara which was kind of in the south um, and what was what was the situation there versus you know the taliban and northern alliance what was that that like i felt we understood afghanistan better in terms of the situation like the demographics the the tribal demographics the power brokers i felt that we understood it a lot better in iraq we didn't we don't understand anything um and you go from a situation where at the beginning of it we were just walking outside the front of the base in berets with our rifles at our side very peacefully where at the end we had to fight our way outside of the camps that we were in really we we were under siege at all Um, times considerable amount yeah there were bases there where we'd have to go in units would be sent in to break the sieges to get them more ammunition get more food in like it deteriorated to a level where it was clear that we'd lost control um we didn't have basic kit and equipment we were living off like the yellow humanitarian food rations that were dropped during the war got it the british didn't have any helicopters that worked because of the heat um the engines wouldn't work so they could just about do resupplies but they didn't trust them to carry people we were in Land Rovers, which is a fantastic off-road vehicle, but not much use against an IED. Yep. Um, it was just in insane levels of chaos. So can I ask a question then? Um, you know, like I remember when we were in Ukraine, what, what we're told here in America is a lot different than what's happening over there, right? Yeah. That's what I discovered at least. When you were when you when you were in Iraq, was the story there way different than what we were hearing at home? Yeah, in 0304, like there was kind of still an argument that there was a peace plan, that there were politicians who were yeah. had a strategy. The, the situation on the ground was we were without basic necessities, mm. um, just fighting and troops are under siege and there was no plan. So, so we think about today, you drove from New York to Red Bank, right? You had a nice drive. I'm assuming it's a beautiful day. What was your everyday like? What was it like every day in that situation? So you, like just getting through the day, like what was the mindset? You and your your partners. I, I was lucky, like I was 19 years old and I was in an infantry unit. Like I was young, um, it didn't take a huge mental toll on me. Like I will speak about kind of like my corporals and my sergeants who were in their mid to, mid to late 20s, early 30s. It yeah. took a huge mental toll on them. Were you um, able to see that? Yeah. You know that now or just seeing at the time or? I say, I, I'm still friends with them. A lot of them kind of, they, they go to counseling, they have PTSD, et cetera. For, for the ones of us who, I mean, at 19, like you were very mentally resilient. Sure. Luckily, a lot of the stuff goes over your head as well. So a lot of the crimes that were committed against the civilians and stuff um, mm. w- went over our heads. Like I remember one family we had, they came to the front gate and the father told us this horrific story of what had been done to his family by, by a militia group. Um, and my corporal, who was like six foot six, a huge man. Um, he, he was a Royal Green Jacket, which is like a, like a light infantry regiment in the army, very famous regiment. Um, he, he just turned around, he burst into tears. Mm. And that was kind of the, yeah, they, there was, it, it was just a really terrible situation. Yeah. Wor- worse than what we saw in Bucha? Same? I, I'd say the human level crimes like what you heard about in butcher where soldiers get drunk and they go out and they do the most heinous things to people yeah. because of their disregard for another group because of their ethnicity um or or their what religion they follow etc very similar Got it. Um, the so- russians are doing it at a scale that is bigger but those kind of very disgusting kind of very personal level crimes being committed by militia members or or the russians did in butcher by conscripts yeah mindlessly shooting people you know rape all that kind of terrible things um that that was very clear in iraq you know as i'm sitting here listening to you i'm just thinking about like wow religion um war uh ethnicity 
it hasn't changed in thousands of thousands of years. At the end of the day, it comes down to control. And when, you know, groups do other things to other groups, it really doesn't make any sense except for indoctrination, influence, and, uh, you know, being able to, to, to gather as much power as possible, right? Yeah, and we, we can speak to polarization as well, right? Yeah. Like those who are in important, occupy important positions within society have a duty not to polarize people. Yes. Um, and what you're seeing, like in Iraq, you have the Sunni Shia divide. Uh, what, what you saw was like intergenerational polarization of the mm. Sunnis against the Shias, even though it's the same religion. They both believe in monotheism. They both believe Muhammad is a prophet. But you would see these this sectarian divide, this sectarian di violence caused by intergenerational polarization. So yes. we, we have to really think like, if you are in a position in society where you have a voice, you have a duty not to polarize people. Anyway, thanks for checking in. And Harvey, one last time, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate you for it. Coming.